Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. So when I think of the Six Doctor and the spin off media, I think of Big Finish, I think of some of the novels, but I primarily think of them in the comics. And if you're going to be doing a Six Doctor in the comics, where's the best place to start? Let's start with Voyager. Mm. So uh, we're, we're going to be doing uh, Voyager next week. We'll be, we'll be doing the, um, the Panini edition, who does have some additional comics in there as well. John Ridgway and uh, Steve Parkhouse uh, and Frobisher the Penguin. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the Six Doctor and Frobisher might be my favourite Six Doctor TARDIS thing. Mm. I'm excited to, uh, to read it. Yeah, it's gonna, excellent. It's going to be good fun. And now our story continues. Welcome, everyone, to the All New Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Chris, how's it going? It, it's good. I had a very Doctor Who-y weekend. As I have. This is the second time I've been talking about The Sixth Doctor. Folks, if you haven't listened to the episodes of Death podcast, you might, uh, in the near future, and possibly by the time this comes out, uh, have heard me um, uh, speaking about a, a certain Sixth Doctor serial that may have been mentioned a few times on this program. <laughs> I wonder which one that might be. <laughs> yeah, it's time lash, folks. So if you have a um, an aversion to tinsel and things becoming you know, the Loch Ness monster, then uh, don't listen to that one. Hmm. But yeah, I think I make a, a sterling defence of time lash. But <laughs> then again, I'm biased. Nice. So uh, yeah, so Doctor Who and the Episodes of Death available in iTunes and podcasty places. Cool. How did the marathon go? I completed it. Uh, five eleven was um, was what I finished it in, which I thought was was good. Um, around about five miles in, I started experiencing sensation in my left knee, and I thought, like, "Oh, this is going to be a long, long day." <laughs> no, it was it was yeah, good, very tiring. And my immediate reaction was never, never again. But then the um, the ballot for the London Marathon for next year opens on Monday and shuts on Friday so I might well enter that one just in case but I mean that ballot is so heavily oversubscribed I suspect I probably won't but anyway enough marathon talk <laughs> I'm pleased to report from uh, the Minnesota side of things that we're finally out from under snow after getting uh, two feet dumped on us in mid-April <laughs> we're, we're finally clear <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Spring is on its way, if not summer. It is. Shall we move on to uh, show and tell? Yes, yes, let's. What would you like to show and or tell? Uh, I've got uh, three different kind of smaller things mm-hmm. to kind of talk about. One is the new Target books, which were mm. just published this past month to Munch uh, Fanfare. Seen lots of articles and uh, interviews about them, and I've read two of the five so far both uh, Russell T. Davies' Rose and uh, The Day of the Doctor by Stephen Moffat. And um, I imported them from the UK because I don't think they're publishing stateside for quite some time. But then I also, I couldn't wait for the... (laughs) for the for the royal post so i uh <laughs> got the got the kindle versions uh yeah. and started on those but uh really really enjoying them and i feel like each in their own way so far has captured the spirit of the old target so mm-hmm. highly recommend those uh my second item is the series nine soundtrack by murray gold so i've been doing a lot of doctor who reading uh listening to the soundtrack which recently came out and i hope uh, series 10 doesn't take quite as long to come out and then uh finally i may be at console room this weekend uh depending on when this podcast posts cool but i will be um there uh mingling and mm-hmm. looking forward to if any listeners want to come up and say hi i'd be happy mm-hmm. to uh meet you in person cool cool who are the guests this year uh it's the paternoster gang ah yes yes you have said you have said cool so okay. it'll be uh 
hopefully be a fun uh, fun yes. convention. Yes, so. yes, no, it should be good fun. Be a snow free convention. <laughs> hopefully so. Yes. Next year they're moving it to January, so I oh. can't imagine anyone wanting to <laughs> visit Minneapolis then. Yeah, that might not be a. <laughs> yes. Hopefully it's like a one year deal and not a permanent uh, change, but mm. hard to say. No, January is not really a great time for a convention. But then again, I wouldn't have thought February would be, but <laughs> Gareth one has been going for, uh, you know, 10 gazillion years. Yeah, well, Los Angeles in February, I think, is pretty pleasant. But yeah, Minnesota, not so much. Yeah, it's an easier sell, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How about you? What do you've got for uh, show and tell? I'm going to go back to sort of marathon territory, actually. But bear with us, folks. I'm not turning this into a running podcast by stealth. Last Sunday, as I often do, uh, I was leading a team of volunteers at London Marathon. And it was it was like 24 degrees in Celsius in the shade. I'm not too sure what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's in the 80s. Certainly, let's put it this way. It was warm. Um, (laughs) There there was no rain or anything. It it was hard work and quite challenging because we we were having people dropping out. There was a couple of medical emergencies in my section. In amongst all of this ran Tim the Dalek. So there was a guy (laughs) that ran 36.2 miles in a Dalek costume. It was kind of, and it was like a framed affair that he was having to kind of carry, presumably on his shoulders in some capacity or other. And uh, so it wasn't a kind of like a, as seen on TV, but also, nor was it just a bit of plastic that was just kind of sucked over. He was having to run within some kind of frame type thing. Bless him, he did it in just under six and a half hours. I have friends of mine who actually ran the marathon without being stuck inside a Dalek slower than that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think Tim Moss was the name of the gentleman. So uh, just in case you're listening, Tim, um, my hat is off to you, sir, is that you ran it just an hour slower than me when I did Brighton. And, uh, and I was never to go run it in, in heat and, uh, and, and with a Dalek on my shoulders. So, uh, yeah, it brought a real smile to my face. I shall put the photo up on the uh, the Facebook page um, and when this episode kind of comes out. So uh, if you want to, you can you can go and, uh, and, and sort of luxuriate in the photo of Tim the Dalek. Hmm. He didn't have to run up any stairs then, I take it? Uh, uh, <laughs> oof, let's put it this way. Going upstairs, certainly for me... <laughs> I stayed downstairs for two days after I mm. finished my marathon. So, yes, I think everybody a bit <laughs> 60s Dalek. Did you know there was a Doctor Who, like, it's a runner's group or runner's club? I've seen their uh, mm. tweets a couple of times. There's like a... No. I don't know if it's a... I don't know if they have a podcast or not, but it's definitely a... Um, a thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Might be a Facebook group, but something to okay. look for. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So, Voyager. Yes! Voyager, Voyager, which I don't believe you'd read before. I have not. This is my first time experiencing Voyager, yes. if you don't count the uh, TV series uh, Voyagers or Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I do not. Um. <laughs> we should mention that we're reading the collection from Panini. Yes. Which they started their graphic novel reprint line, but way back in 2004. Mm-hmm. And it's still going strong with some stops and starts along the way. I think they're up to volume 26 now, uh, The Land of the Blind, which is coming out later this summer. And this collection was published back in 2007. I didn't pick up on the uh, pun until a couple of years ago. The uh, whole Panini Press mm. pun. Oh, what was a sandwich or something? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I totally did. <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> well, I, I've always kind of because like Panini is famous in this country for sticker albums, mm. particularly for things like kind of World Cups and stuff. You would have people in kind of like playground trying to trade their Panini packs um, to get those kind of rare stickers. I think that brand is most associated with in this country, and it's an Italian publishing oh. arm or something. Yeah, I think I assume so. They're the people who now publish. WM. Mm. I'll start with the uh, artist, so John mm. Ridgway, yes. uh, began his career drawing DC Thompson's Commander War stories. Mm-hmm. He was also had a professional work as a design engineer for some time, and then in 1984, he um, started work on Marvel and DC Comics with mm-hmm. also some British titles such as 2000 AD, Warrior, and then his, of course, his work on Doctor Who magazine. Yeah. And he's also worked on other adaptations like Famous Five and Babylon 5. And here's an interview in the Panini edition. He was talking about his time as an engineer uh, in the 80s. And he said, if anyone ever gives you the opportunity to travel to Nigeria, don't. 
Um, <laughs> Unless you're looking for uh, Doctor Who missing episodes. It's, it's a good hunting ground, I think, at least for, uh, for <laughs> Doctor Who missing episodes based on past experience. So anything else you'd add about John Ridgway? Uh, no, apart from the fact that he is, in many ways, the definitive Sixth Doctor artist. Because um, yeah, I don't think anybody else has rated the Sixth Doctor during his TV run in DWM. We've encountered his work before, too. He did one of the issues of Prisoners of Time. Yes. Which also included uh, Frobisher. Yes. Yeah, one of my favorite ones from, uh, from Prisoners of Time, I think. I saved the uh, John Ridgway interview until last, just in case. Spoilers. Of spoiler. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Having learned from my previous uh, encounters with author notes or interviews. Uh, yes, dear Doctor Who collected edition people or reprint people, if you're going to have a spoilery thing, can you just put the spoiler interview at the back? Mm. That would be lovely, because uh, it, it does frustrate me. I'm just reading through notes and go, oh. Oh, oh, I would have liked to have discovered that myself. But it, I don't think he, he actually comes out with anything spoilery. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty... Um, pretty spoilery. At least this one was pretty spoiler yeah, free. Because in the, in the Marvel edition of Voyager, there has an afterword by Colin Baker, um, <laughs> which is curious. Uh, and there was nothing spoilery in that either, um, particularly, um, apart from the fact that he said that he wished that he'd actually travelled with Frobisher in the TV series. Hmm. Was that the... 1989 reprint where it was colorized it was yes gina hart did the colors on that quite vibrant colors for that but uh yes the six doctors coat looks much better in black and white <laughs> <laughs> um so steve parkhouse mm. he's he's a writer and artist uh, yes. who worked on dwm for about five years mm-hmm. spanning three different doctors and he is the creator or the credited creator of uh, Frobisher. Mm. And he's also worked on Judge Dredd, Future Shock, uh, Sinister Dexter, Mm -hmm. and Moon Runners, all for uh, 2000 AD. Mm -hmm. And he also worked on Warrior, The Invisibles, Sandman, Omega Man, Transformers, Hellboy, and Milkman Murders for Dark Horse. And he also created the Bo Jeffries saga with Alan Moore. These things kind of bang on. I've never heard of the Bo Jeffries saga. <laughs> <laughs> the Alan Moore-ness is kind of like, oh yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> I was like, um, I'm supposed to know that? I think <laughs> I'm relatively well-versed in comics, I'm like, but I don't know that. So maybe that's a bit of ignorance. These are kind of Steve Parkhouse's, uh, I think it's his final contributions to, um, um, to Doctor Who. I don't think he does anything after this. Also, interestingly... His um, his wife is the letterer. Hmm. Whether or not she was married to him at the time, I don't know. I, I like to think that they fell in love over Frobisher. Do you know who is... Um, Annie Halfaker um, was uh, what she's credited as. Huh. Uh, so uh, oh, Annie Parkhouse now. She um, went on doing lettering for quite some time, uh, looking through. So, But she started with um, um, Shapeshifter for, um, in her Doctor Who run. And, and she's the letter for all of these comics, so uh, she she outlasted her husband on it. Hmm. And then finally, we have Alan McKenzie, who uh, wrote several of the strips, some of which are in this collection. Yes, under the pseudonym uh, Max Stockbridge. Yeah, because he was the editor at the time of Doctor Who magazine, and so in the grand tradition of editors um, uh, for Doctor Who, kind of commissioning themselves um, and and trying to disguise it. Stockbridge is a, a reference to a um, to to a town that often appears in Fifth Doctor and sometimes in Eighth Doctor comics, hmm. and possibly earlier as well, maybe. Something back in my mind tells me the Stockbridge we first encountered in the Fourth Doctor's time in DWM, but I might be wrong. So we have seven stories mm-hmm. in this collection, um, and they range in parts from anywhere from two parts to five parts. Yeah. So I think what we're going to do is similar to kind of how we approached Prisoners of Time and then our short story collections is... Uh, we bring back the timer. Yep. <laughs> yes, the TARDIS timer. Yay! The TARDIS timer returns. Yay! I think we're going to set it for 10 minutes. Yeah. Since we've got a few different stories for yeah. for each. Some of these may, we may take less than 10. <laughs> Get that set up here. Cool. And then uh, my uh, introduction to Frobisher came not in comic form, but in audio form, played mm. by Robert Jessick. So my first kind of encounter with him was in The Holy Terror by Rob Shearman. Mm. And then Rob Shearman also did another audio with Frobisher, the Maltese Penguin, yeah. uh, for Big Finish. So it's kind of interesting that character who was created for the comics, uh, my first couple of exposures to him was in audio form as opposed to a visual form. Mm-hmm. So, But I, I think that speaks to the appeal of him. He also appeared in a novel 
So um, David McKinty's uh, Mission Improbable. Um, or has, Impractical. Impractical even, yes. Sorry. Uh, has the um, the six Doctor and Frobisher in it. So shall we uh, begin with uh, the shapeshifter? Yes. Yes. All right. So this is uh, part one. Late at night, a clerk is working in his office. He doesn't know that his phone is a Wifferdill spying on him. He calls his wife to tell her that he'll be working late, but in truth, he's going out with another woman. Yes. <laughs> the Wifferdill transforms into a pigeon to go to his office and inform his client. He flies over the city, but is attacked by an owl and makes a crash landing in a garbage can. Having just watched uh, Planet Earth 2 and the, uh, the, <laughs> yes, the episode set in cities, it. I can totally visualize this. Yeah, yes. The Wifferdill becomes a uh, hamburger uh, in the garbage can and is picked up by a homeless man who takes a bite out of him. And then the Wifferdill now with he's a hamburger with eyes, legs, and arm fleas. Yes. And the Wifferdill is named Avan Tarklu, which is uh, Avan Taklu. Yeah, that's frustrating. So this is so I, I first read this nearly thirty years ago. And this is the first time I've got that joke. <laughs> <laughs> the investigator who hasn't a clue. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and his original state is is kind of like an amorphous blob creature with mm. spectacles. Um, yeah. He arrives at his office to check his messages, and he mm. sees a wanted message for the sixth doctor, as well as the fifth, because he, he mm. sort of sees sees two different images of him, doesn't he? He sees the, the, the fifth doctor and the sixth, which is quite a nice thing because this is the sixth doctor's debut in the comic, so you, you get mm. a little bit of a, a a nod to the to the end of the era. After those, he sees the wanted message. He transforms into a barfly and going to different uh, watering holes and pubs to see what he can find out about the doctor. And after four nights of doing this, he finds the doctor and flies into his glass of chocolate soda. And uh, the waiter notices Avantaklu as a fly and takes the glass while the doctor leaves. The waiter empties the glass into the sink while the Wifferdill transforms himself into a fish to get outside, you know, kind of going through the, the pipes uh, back into his original shape where he encounters the doctor leaving the pub. And the doctor goes to his TARDIS where he's attacked by two men with vibro knives. The doctor handles one attacker, but the second one pulls out a gun, and the Wifferdill attacks. His uh, right hand becomes a boxing glove and knocks the second attacker unconscious. And the doctor, unaware of the uh, Wifferdill in his ship, uh, gets into his TARDIS and sets the coordinates to Greenback Bay on Venus. And then uh, Frobisher, or Avant Tarklu, uh, sneaks on board, uh, transforms himself kind of over the TARDIS's time rotor, and uh, hijacks the ship, and that's quite a brilliant image because you got the uh, you get the rotor with kind of like arms and sort of and glasses <laughs> going on. <over it. laughs> uh, yeah, I, can, I can't imagine how it must have been to have read this the first time, like you know, when it had come out. So particularly because this was released in May eighty four, so like not long after people had had to uh, experience the twin dilemma, and then so they go, oh, well, at least the comics are good. Um, but, uh, yeah, at least different. So, uh, but yeah, I think there's a tie-in to an earlier comic too. Mm. Dog Bolter. Dog Bolter was in the Fifth Doctor as well, I think. The Festival of the Five Planets, or so. So the TARDIS has been hijacked um, by this Wifferdill PI. He demands that the Doctor uh, fly the TARDIS to Venus, otherwise uh, he'll uh, suffer sandwiches that bite back. Terror at bath time and shoes that fly away with you. And uh, is it around about here that the doctor says that he's been menaced by professionals and sort of lists off Dalek, Cybermen, and BBC producers? Yes. Yes. Which is very prescient for a, something that came out in 1984, so before, before the hiatus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think it was at the end of the previous story perry mentioned that she was homesick or there was some was it in in the story chaos there's a there's a reason that perry's not with Ah. the doctor yeah but that reason only comes in later so uh chaos i think is a story written by eric sayward um that explains why and why enough eric sayward felt the need to write this i don't know but yeah that explains why perry isn't around for a bit and uh, but yeah so so if you're expecting perry in these first few bits, don't. She's somewhere else. Uh, New York, as it turns out. Does your version of this have Perry on the cover? 
Yes, it does. Okay, yeah, mine does too, but I, apparently there were two versions published, one with and one without Perry. Oh, okay. No, no, no. She's in her um, kind of Caves of Androzani top, I think. Yeah. One of the iconic looks, I guess. Yeah, so so the Doctor says that he's kind of going off to Venus anyway. If the Wifter had wanted a lift, and he, you know, what he'd have to do is ask, <laughs> which seems a little bit charitable for the Sixth Doctor. Um, and uh, the Wifter says that you know he doesn't just want to lift; he wants to uh, hand the Doctor in for um, for the bounty. Uh, so then on Venus, near the building uh, Intra Venus Inc. Uh, the TARDIS materializes and security goes into action surrounding the TARDIS and Dog Bolter, who we mentioned uh, from that earlier story, who's on Venus is think- and is offering the bounty for the Doctor, thinks it's a mm-hmm. trap and gives the order to knock it off but evacuate the building first. A spaceship flies uh, to the building, shooting it with rockets, uh, kind of leaving the building in ruin but without a scratch on the TARDIS. And a uh, white flag appears from within the TARDIS with a uh, paper plane and then on the paper plane is written a list of demands which is brought to Dog Bolter and read by his robot <laughs> and the Wifferdill will exchange the doctor for the reward and then double the reward for the TARDIS itself and uh, Dog Bolter agrees to the first part of it so the doctor is exchanged uh, by a bearded old man Armed with a bazooka and wearing an Australian hat. Yeah, with so the... <laughs> the, the, the cork thing, the sort of thing that any Australian winces at, as certainly no Australian I know actually owns. <laughs> but yes, hat. an Australian <laughs> hat, yes. <laughs> and uh, the old man uh, who's wearing this hat takes the money, goes back into the TARDIS and dematerializes. Mm, dun, dun, dun. So, yeah, meanwhile, um, Doctor's brought to a cell with two security guards. And like these security guards do look very kind of like eighties Marvel. They do look sort of like superhero Marvel y type more. One opens the cell, but when he turns around he sees the doctor's gone, but there's another guard. And these guards now conclude that sort of one of them must be a fake. Well, one guard shoots at another one, just to be sure it's not the doctor, and then it basically turns out that the guard that shot um is is actually the Wifferdill. Um, who had been disguised himself as the Doctor earlier, Tyler's materialises, and we discover that the um, that the old man in the controversial Australian hat uh, is the Doctor in disguise, uh, mm. which um, I would be utterly enchanted by that bit, uh, and and being quite sort of impressed when I was like ten when I first read that. <laughs> but uh, it's the old switcheroo. Yeah, yeah, it's. it's yeah, it's a good fun situation. So uh, the Wifferdill hops on board, and uh, and the money will be split fifty uh, fifty. And as the TARDIS dematerializes, our, our private investigator friend decides to stick around, uh, which kind of leaves the Doctor with no choice really but to let him stay. Hmm. And so that is how Frobisher becomes a companion. It's a, an unusual way. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting introduction story to, yes. for a companion. And it's interesting with the doctor's relationship with money. You know, usually he doesn't seem to need or want it, but maybe uh, maybe funds were running low. So Times he... are tight. It was the 80s. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yeah. These hideous coats can't just sort of materialize on trees. They have to be paid mm-hmm. for somewhere. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. So, so what did you think of this one? Um, did it hold up? Y- for you? Yeah, I mean it's 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 short, it's sweet. I mean it is it's it's very comicky. It's not an attempt to do a TV story. It really does help. It eases you in because um, mm. because uh, you know, this is unlike anything that um, even even regards of budget. The um, the TV show wouldn't try to do a story like this. I don't think. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's quite. It's very tongue in cheek, um, mm. but uh, it's almost um, a bit kind of like Fifth Elementy at times. Mm. Mm. Um, it's good fun and, and a great introduction, I mean, particularly where you sort of see, you know, the Wifferdill changing all the forms in part one. I was just reading it the first time, I was just thinking, wow, this is great. So, what do you think of it? I liked it. It was a good introduction to. Frobisher and kind of having a shape changing companion and I agree with you that I think it acts as like a bridge from because the stories that follow do get pretty kind of wacky and out there but it's a good transition to say like hey come along with us on this voyage if you will and uh you know go along for the ride and take it at face value and some things are going to be absurd but that's that's part of the medium and it's part of the story that they're telling and I and I think it's just 
like you said, it's it's a really well done transition. And I have to say the the artwork, um, especially, is really well done. I can see why John Ridgeway is so prized, you know, and, and just lauded and um, just really evocative artwork. And it it's of that it's of a certain time too, like where you, almost it reminds me a little bit of some of the old uh, Conan the Barbarian mm. illustrations. And yeah, just just that um, you know that stark black and whiteness. It's just um, really evocative. Yeah, it certainly is. Nice. The uh, TARDIS went off there a little a couple. I'm like a minute ago. I don't know if you heard it, but oh uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I'll turn it up a little bit. Okay. Um, and I'll we'll get started on the second one. Yes, Voyager. <laughs> Voyager. This one, it opens with some narration where the doctor is a prisoner aboard uh, Voyager's death ship. And this is where our dramatic reading comes in for the month, read by Matt, my husband again. And uh, we'll listen to that here. It was a devil ship, the Voyager. The great ship plowed the seas, sheets creaking, though not a breath of air moved at our backs. Wind wraiths shrieked in the rigging, and all the yards were aglow. In the ocean, creatures stirred and followed, running alongside us like dolphins. Leviathans were there, monsters from the deep with dinner plate eyes. Creatures only imagined churned in our white wake. The Kraken himself saluted our passage, though none but me stood on deck to see him. It was a death ship. And then I sensed his presence. He had come up from below to taste this timeless ocean. He was not like other men. He spoke not. At times he appeared not to move, nor even to take breath. And yet I could sense his untrammeled thoughts, as distant as the Southern Cross, as dark as unlimbed night, as deep as the uncharted seas. And I was his prisoner. He had lashed me to the wheel, lest in storm-haunted waters I should disappear forever. Just Voyager and me. Just him and me and the endless oceans, and the rocks at the edge of the world where the waters thundered into the great abyss with the roar of hell. To the very edge we went. I screamed for release, but he just motioned silence with a finger to his lips, as if addressing a wayward child. I am a lord of time, I screamed. And I am a lord of life, he thundered in reply, and his words soared aloft and were one with the wind. Then there was only the void and the wind wraiths howling like a thousand lost souls. Their screams mingled with mine, filling my ears, blotting out the world and its horrors, drowning even the cataract itself, howling, howling. So that was uh, kind of the introduction to to Voyager, uh, the opening narration. And the Doctor, as we said, is a prisoner aboard Voyager's death ship, and they journey to the edge of the world and fall off. The Doctor wakes in the TARDIS to find the door open. Outside his coat is draped over a snowman uh, with the Doctor's umbrella under its arm. He collects his belongings, and then he continues on uh, through the wasteland, um, reflecting on how... He's uh, enjoyed uh, Frobisher's companionship, so it seems like it takes place a, a little bit after the shapeshifter, where they may have had some adventures. Yeah, yeah, you get a feeling that they spend a bit of time together. So, and uh, the Doctor meets up with Frobisher, who has now disguised himself as a penguin to kind of merge in with the locals. <laughs> Not that you see a lot of penguins in this one, um, and uh, they they spot a ship um, frozen in the ice, which the Doctor recognizes as being the one from his dream. And uh, they go aboard, and they find some star charts in the hold, which is a bit surprising. Uh, and, uh, and they kind of prepare to uh, leave of them when a man comes from behind them, threatening them with a gun. Mm. And this man ties the doctor to a chair and escapes off with the star charts. Uh, Frobisher goes up on deck, and the doctor frees himself, and they watch through a telescope as this uh, older man makes his escape in what looks to be an original Da Vinci flying machine. Yeah, and uh, the Doctor and Frobisher um, sort of uh, head back to the TARDIS and uh, follow him. And they arrive at um, at a lighthouse, uh, sort of at night. And, uh, and the TARDIS is kind of picking up these powerful uh, energy readings. 
Uh, so, um, so the Frobisher goes into the water and uh, decides to regurgitate a fish for the Doctor, which is uh, a lovely <laughs> bit of detail. <laughs> he's he's going full in with this being a penguin thing, uh, and then this beautiful robot-like human or giant robot appears and advances upon them. And the Doctor tells Frobisher that this being is an automaton, a uh, living soul inside a mechanical body. And it just kind of eerily walks past them and into the sea. And the doctor guesses that it could be connected to a craft that Frobisher saw uh, under the water. And so um, the doctor tells Frobisher to return to the TARDIS. And uh, he peers through the lighthouse keyhole and sees um, the bloke that he that um, they've been chasing kind of sitting in there. The doctor uh, sneaks in with his sonic screwdriver uh, and, uh, and presses a man um, um, with his own gun. And... Uh, and this guy, who clearly hasn't watched a Six Doctor on TV, uh, reckons that he wouldn't kill him, <laughs> wouldn't do any violence, and so it makes his escape. Um, so, uh, and the Six Doctor kind of uh, follows, and then so he starts falling, and sort of just falls through this kind of blackness, um, which is quite a striking image, uh, and then finds himself kind of hanging onto the side of the lighthouse, far above the ground, and the man leans over him. And uh, and then the doctor finds he's hanging from a table, um, and it's, it's all getting a little bit weird. And uh, he asks the man who he is, and so the figure sort of um, comes out with various different names. And then he sort of says that he is legend. And we learn his name is uh, Astrolabus. Mm-hmm. Is that how we? Astrolabus. Yeah, Astrolabus. Yeah. Uh, Astrolabus tells the doctor the story of Alexandria in Egypt, a, a city that he helped make great and had the lighthouse there, and how Alexandria fell and uh, Astrolabus took to the stars. The doctor identifies him as a thief who stole the Book of the Old Time, which gets a mention in uh, The Deadly Assassin, I think. And the doctor flees and then finds the world around him transforming. And so running down a winding staircase, he sees a kind of like, um, a door and sort of tentacles come from behind try to squeeze him, but he breaks free. And then with final effort, he escapes and then finds himself in space. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of cool transitions where... Yeah. Just the the artwork in this one is is something else. Yeah. Um, The Doctor finds himself back on Earth in the sea, and inside the TARDIS, Frobisher activates the TARDIS scanner. He spots the Doctor in the water and goes out of the TARDIS out to help him. Astrolabus makes his way back to the top of the lighthouse, which then turns into a rocket, and uh, Voyager appears in his ship as the rocket takes off, disappearing into the clouds. And so Voyager, I don't think we've actually described Voyager, he's this kind of Black Guardian-esque figure um it's possibly one way to describe it. it's, got, it's got this sort of really old face but he, yeah he feels to me like he is a guardian mm. and he's he calls himself the lord of life so yeah um, so if you have time lords he would be i guess a, a life lord yeah but yeah he seemed like at least as powerful as like say the gods of ragnarok mm. or um yeah one of the eternals i would say he certainly has the ability to kind of get in the doctor's head. Yes, oh, definitely, definitely. So the doctor um, sort of finds himself once more on kind of Voyager's sort of ship, you know, this wooden ship from earlier, at the edge of the world. And then again, he wakes to find himself on a rocky outcrop of Frobisher. And uh, they return to the TARDIS, and the doctor sees Voyager again. Um, telling him that he has to get the star charts back. Kind of puts the doctor on like a fetch quest. Yes. Not unlike yeah. the key to time. Yeah, yeah. I think Voyager does share some DNA with the, with the Guardian. Yeah, what do you reckon of this one? <laughs> uh, I really like this one. Uh, yeah. It was very surreal. Uh, mm. The artwork was just beautiful. Uh, I know we don't can't really convey that, you know, in the podcast in like an audio form, but uh, I enjoyed it. It it did seem a little open ended. Like you could tell this is the beginning of something else, yeah. and it would have been nice, I think, to maybe flesh out Voyager a little bit more, but at the same time him being so mysterious you know i I suppose like when the white guardian first appeared didn't have um you know a whole lot of info about his backstory or anything Mm. so i guess i was left with like a sense of being intrigued and and kind of wanting to know more and and how this would turn out it certainly is very enigmatic quality about it i mean it reminds me very much of um of kind of like samuel coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner Mm. in places i mean it's yeah, because there's this kind of lyrical quality, and certainly that opening monologue you know, that uh, that we had the reading from earlier—that that's just 
brilliant was. I agree. I think it was brilliant. And um, I kept getting flashes of uh, Tales of the Black Freighter from uh, mm. Watchmen, which would have been after this, I think. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, that kind of came to mind just the with the narration and the sailing ship, you know, through the through the stars. That yeah. sort it just kind of brought that to mind, I guess. Mm. As well, you're getting a few glimpses of Frobisher's character because like at one point he he tries to disguise himself and his idea of disguising himself is uh, putting on a pair of glasses and a false nose kind of like you know, Marx Brothers style kind of start to fall in love even more with Frobisher and also he talks about how he spent 14 years disguised as a till in a supermarket in Walthamstow and, he, and because he was in love with a cashier but it turns out she was only in it for the money and I just kind of go I'm not sure when you're telling this is a real thing or not but oh <laughs> <laughs> hmm. yeah oh Frobisher uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Frobisher, uh, Frobisher and Six Doctor is is my favorite of the Six Doctor starter screws. Mm. All right, so yes. now we go on to uh, oh, there's the TARDIS. <laughs> right on time. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, let me reset the timer that, again. That was the one Start. I was most worried about. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got it in there. Yes. Um, yeah. So. No, that was, visually it was just um, just amazing. It's great. Yeah. All right, so now we're on to uh, the, th- the third story in the collection, which is Polly the Glot. And uh, yes. opens up at a uh, space terminal for uh, passengers to transfer between different starships. And we run into Dr. Ivan Asimov. Uh, <laughs> who could he be named after <laughs> dr asimov is uh i guess he's a he's a, he's a he has, character in the fifth doctor stories in the comics and yeah. he um kind of looks i would say he was green but he's black and white so i don't know what color mm. he is but he has uh got like two eyes and a snout uh above his eyes and to uh, kind of antenna looking. He's an interesting looking alien. <laughs> yes, there aren't too many like him. Mm. So at the space terminal, Dr. Ivan Asimov trying to make his connection to his flight, but then he sees the TARDIS, which, as you said, he recognized from an earlier story, and he's really happy to see it and the doctor. So he's running towards the TARDIS, but he bumps into Frobisher, who's walking out of the TARDIS. And after meeting him, he explains to Frobisher that he thought it was the doctor's TARDIS. And then the doctor comes out and Dr. Asimov is taken aback because, of course, the doctor's regenerated since they had last met. But the doctor kind of explains that he's changed his face a few times, he says. After realizing it's the doctor, Dr. Asimov asks the doctor for his help. But <laughs> too many doctors there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, before he can explain what the problem is, he realizes that he has to uh, catch his flight. So he gives the doctor a card with coordinates of the organization he works for, which is called the Save the Zyglot Trust. But meanwhile, in space, uh, the um, aliens called the Akers, and they're busy kind of capturing a Zygot uh, for the Ringway Carnival. On his flight, Asimov's dreaming of the carnival, where he saw Polly the um, as I got and uh, fell in love with her and so um, h- how do we describe um, as I got there's this wonderful kind of it's not really a space whale but you kind of think that it's a bit space whaling it's it's this large vaguely insectoidy squiddy aquatic-y thing. it's just a beautiful creature I'd say like a space whale crossed with like a paramecium or something yeah, yeah, and so um, yeah, so Asimov um, sort of decides to uh, to rescue Polly, and so when his flight uh, docks into another spaceship, he's a bit concerned about what he's going to say to um, to the trustees because Zygots are still being captured, and the trust is kind of is lacking the necessary funds to try to kind of prevent this. Parallels to kind of um, um, sort of whale charities and dealing with I think probably the Japanese and and other countries at that time, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so um, arriving, Asimov sees the TARDIS and is directly taken by Frobisher in disguise, who points a gun at him. And uh, Asimov sort of asks him what's going on, and the Doctor sort of says that he's been kidnapped. Dun dun dun. So there's a, a space station, and there's a newsstand within the space station, and Frobisher's in disguise, and he takes a paper that reports on uh, the kidnapping of Doctor Asimov and brings it to the Doctor. 
And the doctor explains that the trust is broke, so the Zyglot Trust, because they can't pay the, the ransom fee to, to free Asimov, the public potentially might donate to the trust. So the, the whole kidnapping is a publicity stunt to help Asimov uh, free some of the Zyglots, including Polly, that have been captured. And Asimov tells the doctor that the president of the trust is one uh, Professor Astrolabus, uh, who will be furious. And upon hearing that name, the doctor faints and gets a nightmare of a giant head of Astrolabus uh, kind of eating him, or swallowing him. And at the meeting of the trust, the news that Asimov has been kidnapped uh, comes through, and Astrolabus uh, starts to suspect that the doctor has something to do with it. In the TARDIS, the doctor wakes up um, and sort of thinking that he's under the influence of some kind of post-hypnotic mm-hmm. suggestion. Um, and uh, he then decides to take matters into his own hands by um, going onto the Akers spaceship. Uh, we've also got uh, Asimov's kind of going with Arnold's stun gun and uh, and and, and uh, they're trying to infiltrate the ship whilst kind of Frobisher um, sort of splits from them. Uh, and uh, so Frobisher has some Akers who see him and start sounding the alarm. And the captain of the ship employs the Defender, which is a ship's robot. And the Doctor and Asimov uh, encounter the, this robot who hits the Doctor with a mop. And uh, Asimov then sort of threatens the robot, but it's all it's, it's, it's all looking a little bit grim. Hmm. And the robot, afraid that Asimov will shoot him, uh, says he's not a defender, but in fact the janitor of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a so... cop-out of a cliffhanger, but it's just brilliant. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's almost like it's almost like a parody of bad Doctor Who resolutions and cliffhangers. Yeah, I was getting a flash forward to uh, Paradise Towers with the, <laughs> with yeah. the robot. Um, the robot tells uh, Asimov where he could find the commander of the ship. So on the bridge, the captain and an Acker are studying Frobisher, and they decide to sell him to uh, the same carnival. The Doctor and Asimov enter and demand to release the Zyglots. And the captain says they only have one, but uh, threatens to kill it by tightening the gravity net that's currently, that it's trapped in. Um, And at that moment, the real Defender robot bursts in, and kind of in the confusion, Asimov shoots the control panel, which explodes and it frees the Zyglot. And Mm -hmm. the captain, held under gunpoint, reveals that his boss is the uh, Great Astral Arbus. Yeah, it's obviously, it's another disguise for uh, uh, for Astrolabus. Yeah. Uh, And so uh, Astrolabus is looking to a crystal ball, then then suddenly hears the TARDIS. Uh, he packs his stuff and sort of tries to escape, but is stopped by Frobisher and Asimov. Um, Realising he can't go away, he kind of kidnaps Frobisher and sort of jumps into his cabinet. And Asimov tries to chase him and opens the cabinet, but he's no traitor, him, only a star field. He runs off to the doctor to tell him the news. Uh, and, uh, and the doctor's meanwhile, he's been meddling with Polly's cage. He's just the, um, the nullifiers, the gravity nullifiers, so that Polly can be released into outer space. And then after the cage explodes, Polly is released and out of happiness blossoms into outer space. It's not a beautiful image. And, uh, and yeah, so back on the carnival, Asimov, oh, poor Asimov, he's depressed that Polly's gone and that his, his love is unrequited. Um, but meanwhile, um, the Doctor leaves him um, to go um, sort of hunt down Frobisher but also kind of gives him the money that the Doctor had stolen from Dogwater earlier. On the case is a note addressed to Asimov saying that the money is sent for the trust and he must always look to the future. Is that something to do with the foundation levels of Isaac Asimov? Does that have kind of a pun on that, I wonder? Yeah, I think it could be. Yeah. Uh, one thing I liked about this one was too is it, it felt like uh, plot points that tie back to the last two or three stories mm. and then some plot points that continue on into the next story. This very much feels like part of a whole almost. Yeah, yeah. As, as opposed to a standalone. Yeah, I mean, it feels like how kind of comics work, you know, quite a few superhero comics are trying to go in the 80s. It also feels somewhat Moffat-y. Mm. Uh, I cannot imagine that Moffat has not read these. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, but... in terms of like little things carrying forward. Yeah, or... the callbacks and everything. So, yeah. Well, there's our timer. Yeah, and, and, and also you can imagine 
Polly the Glot as being like a Matt Smith story. Mm. Yeah. Very, yeah. very much so. Yeah. The Glot at the end, Polly blossoming in space. It, the visually, it reminded me of um, what we had read in our very first podcast, uh, Engines of War, when TARDISes explode and they kind of, their interior dimensions blossom outward. When I was looking at the images, I was like, oh, that's that's kind of what I had in my mind for, <laughs> for the TARDISes way back yeah. when. Shall we continue? Yeah. So we are now at Once Upon a Time Lord. Yes. Which is such a great title, and I imagine Moffat is just so infuriated that it's been <laughs> it's been used already, but hasn't stopped them from reusing titles. But uh... oh, it, he came close with Twice Upon a Time. Yes, I think. yes. So the Doctor's trying to rescue Frobisher, so he heads into the cabinet of Astrolabus, who is that same character who was you know flying the Da Vinci car a few <laughs> yes. issues earlier. Yeah, and. Uh, so he goes inside this cabinet, and as the doctor exits the TARDIS, he's attacked by a dark rider who attempts to kill him. In a very Tolkien way. <laughs> and uh, he kind of rides away after, after the doctor ducks out of the way. The doctor does find Frobisher, who insists that the doctor come and meet his friends. But the doctor resists, saying that he doesn't trust Astrolabus, and warns Frobisher that he believes that the reality that they are in isn't real. So it, it feels very, um, this whole section, this two-parter feels very much like the mind robber or um stories like that or possibly the ultimate foe mm. <laughs> which obviously hasn't been made by this point but uh or, but yeah. or deadly assassin yeah. yeah 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 meanwhile um astralibus is watching from inside the carnival um where uh, kind of children are watching the doctor of frobisher and astralibus instructs them to put on their thinking caps so that they could control the story. The Doctor and Frobisher are now in a forest, and uh, they meet um, a badger uh, called Brock. Basically, I mean, it suddenly becomes Rupert the Bear. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how familiar you are, Matt, with uh, Rupert the Bear, but it was, it was a kind of, I think it's still ongoing, it's a sort of comic from possibly like the 20s or 30s that has kind of pictures, and then it has a lot of text at the bottom kind of like helps children yeah some children who aren't necessarily particularly up with reading and it's a very distinctive style and we basically have that for like four pages in here it's brilliant so dr frobisher meets this badger that gives frobisher a worm and uh, they come under attack um from some natives that are trying to cook and eat frobisher so then i think would be like uh, maybe a stereotypical representation of an indigenous population <laughs> tie frobisher to a stick and carry him horizontally and get a bowl ready to cook him in and the doctor is watching this uh saying to himself that uh penguins taste awful and give you terrible heartburn (laughs) and then um a loincloth wearing man who's mostly naked uh kind of looks like a tarzan or or conan figure cuts the ropes off frobisher and and frees him and spears follow frobisher as he runs to the doctor yeah so frobisher asks the doctors what's happening and uh, he doesn't feel like he's in control suddenly these giant feet appear in the woods and there's a kind of a troll with furs and uh and and sort of swinging a giant axe and then they find themselves running to a castle they also kind of realise that um, you know, that they're inside a kind of you know, they're, well, yeah, they're inside a magician's cabinet. So that is all a bit of a kind of like a fantasy world. Astrolabus uh, is the you know, is is behind it all and has this sort of wonderful thing where he sort of says that he's a thespian, uh, gazetteer, man about town, and legend in his own lunchtime, amongst many other titles. <laughs> There's a kind of a night guard kind of kills the troll. It's all getting a bit mad. You then cut to Astrolabus sitting in a throne Mm. chair playing with a doctor puppet on strings. And the doctor bursts through the doors and, you know, with his own list of words (laughs) to call Astrolabus... uh, (laughs) where yeah. Astrolabus remarks, oh, you've been reading a thesaurus. Yeah. Again, predicting Colin Baker's portrayal, because like it's it's not why they're the character of the Six Doctors suddenly start using big words for no obvious reason. He pulls a sword from the wall and cuts off the strings of the puppet, uh, telling Astrolabus to get out of his mind. Astrolabus pulls a sword and they fight, and the Doctor rips the enemy's sleeve, and he sees on the arm beneath the sleeve is the missing star charts that Voyager was looking for, asking him to uh, retrieve are tattooed all over Astrolabus's body. Which is a great reveal. I thought that was really cool. Uh, so. Later used in uh, Prison Break. 
<laughs> the TV, the TV show. <laughs> yes, yeah. Astrolabus um, starts kind of running, and so we see him kind of going through mountains, kind of on a merry-go-round. We find him running across the page of the comic, trying to find a shortcut, <laughs> um, and because uh, he just wants to make it to the next episode. It's very fourth wall breaking here. <laughs> Yes. Uh, the, the doctor catches up with Astrolabus and forces him to tell the truth to uh, Voyager, the life lord. The villain, so Astrolabus asks Voyager for mercy, but then Voyager tells Astrolabus that because the star charts were stolen, he will have access to the most mysterious dimension of all, the dimension of death. Uh, Astrolabus vanishes with the charts, uh, which are on on his skin. So the sandstorm hits, and then Astrolabus kind of vanishes within it, meaning that the Doctor completed his task for Voyager. And the Doctor has managed to his mind is now kind of free of uh, Astrolabus's influence, and he finds uh, Astrolabus's remains. And well, when I say remains, he's still alive, but he's just barely tries to sort of find out from Astrobus why he was doing all this, and it turns out that it was Astrobus' last incarnation. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so and we we like Astrolabus have kind of run out of time, but yeah, he, he, but Astrolabus just kind of he, he he sort of dies. The castle blows up. Frobisher, um, Frobisher and Doctor find themselves back in the carnival. There ends the story. They probably does see a whole host of little small penguins at one point. It's quite funny. <laughs> yeah, this one um, was very surreal. Like it, it kind of took it up a notch from from where it was previously. And uh, um, I did like the very ending where uh, you know the Furbisher asks like, "Hey, let's let's go visit this carnival." <laughs> the doctor's <laughs> like, "Like I've had quite enough of that. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather go somewhere else." Yeah. Uh, but it's nice that his, I mean, the doctor can tell that Voyager, who had been in his mind and kind of driving him on to, to find the star charts, now that um, Astrolabus has been caught and returned and the doctor's escaped from his magical cabinet, mm-hmm. it feels like it's the end of a chapter in a way yes. and that the quest yeah. is over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's where the graphic novel, uh, the original Marvel version of it ends. And uh, that, that, yeah, that does seem like a good stopping point. But it is not where we shall stop. Because uh, we, shall, we shall continue on to, uh, to War Game, but with now a, a change of writer. Because uh, it's Steve Parkhouse um, sort of felt that, uh, that he was being asked to write things that were a little bit too surreal. And you kind of see his voice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Doctor and Frobisher are playing. Uh, I can't tell if it's four dimensional chess or five dimensional <laughs> chess. <laughs> the Doctor's yeah. added a few different dimensions to it, yeah. and uh, he's uh, been beat by the Doctor quite a few times. But they land the TARDIS uh, about three miles or so outside of a village, which is it's a kind of a dusty desert planet, and um, the Doctor and Frobisher make their way to the city below the doctor decides to put on a uh, sun hat with hanging beads from it not an australian hat not close to one but yes. yeah it looks more <laughs> looks more spanish in origin i would say yes. or portuguese perhaps and he recommends that frobisher also change his form so frobisher decides to look like conan basically doesn't he yeah. <laughs> or he-man with yes. the yeah. Com- complete with the uh, page boy haircut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a bit more he-man, isn't he? So, the doctor says he throws as being a very gaudy look. <laughs> right, okay. Frobisher's now a seven foot tall barbarian. <laughs> yes, yeah. Frobisher, well, they, they, they go into a bar and Frobisher um, uh, tries to order um, a, a Manhattan. Uh, and then the, um, the doctor sort of says that uh, you know, they don't have any money to kind of like pay for the drinks. And uh, but it, yeah, they're they're in they're in a little bit of trouble with the owner, uh, and so to kind of to get money back on uh, the bar, the Doctor and Frobisher are being sold as slaves. A uh, chap in a black hood uh, buys them uh, and sets them free, but it's only because he's been told to bring them to his master as guests. His name is Akmar. He's advisor to um, someone called Kaun, Lord of the Seven Provinces. It's it's, it's 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 all getting a little bit kind of you know a, a little bit Conan in fantasy, which makes what happens next a bit of a surprise. Um, yeah. Is uh, an enemy of Khan named Vagar the Vengeful had um, uh, captured Khan's uh, daughter, you know, so they're brought to the master and they're mailed to kneel before him, 
and it turns out it's a draconian and the draconian sort of says your fame has spread even to this guy i'm not going to do it for the rest of it even to this galactic backwater yeah that was a surprise yeah, and a beautiful reveal of the draconian mm. uh warrior can too really striking again artwork like a full panel reveal um it does make me wonder why the Draconians haven't uh, been brought back to New Who yet. I think they would make for a, an excellent update. Yeah, it's got to only be a matter of time. I mean, we've, we've had multiple Zygon reappearances. I mean, uh... Maybe uh, Jody Whittaker will encounter the Draconians. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Chibbers, if you're listening. The Draconian, Kaon, he knows the Doctor and he's encountered his blue box before and he knows the Doctor is a Time Lord, but the Doctor can't recall encountering him. A craft took on to an outlying world of the draconian empire but ran into a meteor field and it crashed uh, on this planet and only uh, him and his wife survived and he established himself as a warrior and became a leader over a kind of a group of barbarians uh, his wife ended up dying in childbirth and his daughter kara he raised as as his son bringing her up as as a warrior which isn't necessarily the traditional <laughs> I guess draconian gender role sort of thing. And then um, the land that Kaon had taken had once belonged to uh, this other barbarian, Vagar, who that kind of explains the motivation for the for the kidnapping earlier of, of his daughter. He talks a little bit about like how Draconia, how daughters typically aren't raised as warriors and, and that sort of thing. It feels a little bit Mulan-like in this part. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess. Well, I say I guess I've never seen Mulan. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah yeah so um, Frobisher asks what all of this has got to kind of to do with him the, the doctor agrees to kind of help to to prevent bloodshed they suddenly start hearing words um from kind of you know, like observers that have uh, that Vega has got uh, Kara chained to a pole so um Frobisher and the rest of them kind of head off on these kind of like dinosaur horses uh and uh, and and Frobish is kind of complaining that his back is hurting with this um with, with his kind of he-man uh life form and uh, sort of hopes that this isn't going to take too long and uh, yeah and so the doctor sort of says that he'll he'll take um Kaon and Kara to uh civilize station as one safe place to kind of to free Kara yeah so Kaon's troops storm uh Vagar's stronghold quite a bit of kind of like fight sequences and Frobisher gets a um he gets this sword kind of like against his neck and uh, and then he sort of makes himself even bigger <laughs> to try to kind of try to get out of it uh, yeah and then he gets uh as a giant the, yeah. the, the warrior he's fighting stabs him in the leg with his sword anyway and then Frobisher <laughs> shrinks back down and he's got a he's got a flesh wound then yeah it's um, like being punctured yeah uh two of the bodyguards with Kaun and the doctor finish up the warriors from Vega's side and Kaun gets into it even though he's kind of an older draconian now but he breaks out the battle axe and starts swinging and they're still trying to find his daughter Kara and some of the bodyguards accompanying them are killed off by Vegar, the other uh, warlord but then Kaun kills Vegar with his sword and Frobisher frees Kara and Kaun tells her that hey we get to go home back home to draconia now but then from behind them uh one of the trolls that were working on the side of the of vagar uh stabs him through his back and you see the blade kind of come out of his chest and then kaon in his dying breath manages to turn around and swing his sword down on the this troll killing him but uh, he's killed as well and then um it ends with frobisher saying hey we better get out of here but kara decides to stay behind to lead her father's people and to bury her father so it, it kind of ends sadly where the doctor and frobisher slowly leave and there's there's a lot of destruction and mm. not a whole lot of resolution i think to the problems on this planet it, it kind of feels almost like a like a next generation of deep space nine klingon story mm. um you, you're right. It's quite. It's it's a darker tone than some of the other stories we've been reading thus far. But I mean, it's certainly in that second part of it, I, I, I really really enjoyed. I mean, the first part I was thinking, where are we going? Where are we going with this? And I was like, oh wow, okay, draconians, um, and we've got fantasy, but we've kind of sci-fi bits. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, I, I thought this was good fun, mm. uh, and and also it was the first bit of this that was new to me. 
it felt to me like a um like a lost conan story or a yeah. um almost like a tonally it felt very hartnell or trouton where again you don't have that clean resolution and sometimes you know it's just the doctor being able to escape with his life yeah sort of encounter and, and that's how it kind of felt here where yeah. there's a lot left unsaid and timing impeccable yeah it's the TARDIS going off in the background cool anything else you want to say about that one no all right Sh- shall we uh, move on to Funhouse yeah 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 let's not the TV show do you remember that? No. There was a game show in the yeah. 80s. Oh, yeah, that's, that that's what that? I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, had, so, we had a US version of that that didn't right. run nearly as long as the UK version did. No, no. I'm surprised that the fame of the UK version has gone. It was, it, was certainly, it was a lively way to spend half an hour on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yes, no, no connection to this. Funhouse opens with a what looks to be a haunted house that's needing to feed on things. And then we cut to Frobisher relaxing back in his penguin form on a beach chair in the TARDIS, which is being pulled off course by this uh, house-like creature. And uh, Frobisher mentions that uh, the Doctor's not very good at steering his uh, his ship. <laughs> Frobisher's pretty spot on, isn't he? So they emerge in the house. The Doctor thinks that there may be some kind of like illusions happening here. Tree-like tentacles rise from the floor and grab the TARDIS, but the Doctor's kind of like unaware of this, and he's sort of. They then find a room um, containing a violin and a kind of like a, a still warm drinking glass. So it's kind of like this air of mystery as to kind of like what's happening, uh, and then they kind of hear some screams and uh, and and discover Perry, who uh, then changes into this giant demon-like thing that starts kind of lunging at them. So it's, it's, it's all a bit bizarre. And uh, they go through a door in this house, and um, it's all weird, like M.C. Escher painting style. And they go sideways uh, into this room, and yeah. they uh, see a man stuck on the side of the um, <laughs> the, the floors on the on the side of the wall, sort of thing, yeah. at a at a right angle. Yeah. And the man freaks out and, and runs runs out <laughs> after seeing what, what appears to him to be a man and a penguin you know standing on the side of his wall I can understand can't you? <laughs> and uh the doctor and frobisher find themselves in a small locked room and uh frobisher says you know this is kind of like being in a fun house in the in a carnival which we just saw a couple issues back yeah you know, in the, in yeah the it's a nice callback sort of thing. yes and uh the doctor thinks that he psychically he's kind of can tell that the TARDIS is under attack and he gets a door open eventually but he sees kind of a pit with hellish uh, beasts flying into it and he grabs under the door to prevent himself to be from kind of following down into this deep open uh, chasm and then um, Frobisher is able to pull him back into the room as these bat-like demons are flying at them. Yeah, they realise that the TARDIS is under control by something else. And the Doctor sort of realises that um, you know, the house is kind of joined to the TARDIS. And so it's not that the TARDIS is kind of taking off. It's the whole house is kind of travelling. And so we see the house flying through um, the time vortex, which is quite cool. Frobisher's kind of reviewing the TARDIS log and the Doctor and noticing that the destinations that they're going through are, are almost all like working their way backwards in reverse from all the different places the TARDIS has visited over over the years. Mm-hmm. And the doctors looking, they pull out all the different things that they think um, can help them. So you've got battle axe, a, uh, a jelly baby jar, a piggy bank, <laughs> uh, a ball of yarn, a cricket bat, and a laser gun. And they're like, okay, what are we going to MacGyver out of all of this? To, uh, <laughs> yes. You know, as these tentacles are approaching or infiltrating the TARDIS, he's trying to cut them off, but he's it's not able to uh, really stop the, the assault that's happening on the TARDIS. So the Doctor kind of like feels like a, like a giant hand is going to stop him, and uh, then uh, realizes that the, um, this thing feeds on fear, emotion, and raw energy. The more fearful they are, the stronger it's becoming. Uh, they turn on Tyler's scanner and see that there's a giant eye of tentacles outside, uh, <laughs> and the, the doors start to bulge in a bit. 
and uh, the doctor sort of kind of has a bit of a plan though he sort of says that he wish he paid attention to basic seamanship that, well that would have saved him a lot of trouble <laughs> many times along the way uh, it meant that uh, the end of destruction wouldn't have happened he um, he, he kind of heads off um, uh, to um, to the zero room with a ball of string and so when the doctor pulls on the string he kind of the plan is that he'll shut off the circuit that um, protects the TARDIS's passengers uh, from the um, from the effects of the time vortex outside that being in the zero room should kind of like help you know, shield them from the worst of it mm. and uh, everything outside will regress in time at the same speed as the TARDIS including the house and uh, the doctor sort of says I'm not back in a few minutes you're on your own uh, so uh, and then we just yeah. Do you want to do this? When I turned the page and saw this, I was I was really surprised because it was really effectively done. Yeah. It was uh, you get this image of Frobisher going through you know all of his previous incarnations at, at one end of the string, and then you have the Doctor going through his previous incarnations at the other end of the string. So you get this intercut between like Frobisher turning back into the Conan slash He Man type that he was, and then. You get this cool sequence where the doctor's running and he's kind of, as he's running, he's going through his previous incarnations one at a time until mm. you get back to uh, the first doctor. <laughs> and Frobisher at that point is is like an embryo, <laughs> not as not as long lived as, as the doctor. Um, but the doctor does manage to make it to the switch and flicks it and then he becomes the... Uh, sixth doctor again and house which is trapped in the time vortex and can't get out um screams and you know detaches itself from the from the tardis and it's it's stuck in the vortex and uh frobisher turns back to normal as well and you get house saying uh that he'll rest and in time others will come and he'll feed again and no longer be hungry in time yeah it's a bit creepy isn't it (laughs) which To me, I don't know about you, but the the sequence with all the doctors was really, really well done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I was firstly kind of thinking, oh, it's not a wacky story. We we, we had that a little while ago. But then suddenly just throwing in you know the different um, different incarnations is is great and uh, it's also an idea that um is it chris Abulis ran with for um was it state of change the six doctor novel it might be Bulis or it might be paul leonard um in which you have uh, the six doctor and perry in uh sort of i think it's ancient egypt i've not actually read it but um you do have the six doctor kind of going back through his previous lives and you get Perry turning into a bird um, <laughs> thing as an Avengers of Varus. I'm like, yeah, th- 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 that idea seems somewhat familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> mm. The sequence was just so well done. It, mm. to, to me, it was, and all the likenesses were... Oh, spot on! Yeah, yeah. Really, which which was hard to do, you know, to capture each of them, mm. especially if you're not used to, to drawing them all. Yeah. And it was a really good example, I think, of sometimes in comics you have the ability to show and not tell yeah with very little dialogue they were able to kind of convey what the sequence was yeah. and in my head canon where you have you know the the house going off at the end you know maybe it lands on an asteroid and to me this is a prequel to the doctor's wife mm. this is the same house in both stories you know it could be voiced by michael sheen it's developed a taste for tardises and there yeah. are so many to consume including the corsairs yeah, in my head canon, this is. I'm like, it fits. Why not? It's directly yeah, it could tied. Be, could be. It's the same um, house. <laughs> and Decalogue has a story. Um, one of the Decalogues, I think the second Decalogue, has a second Doctor story with a kind of like a haunted house on an asteroid. Mm. Where I kind of wondered whether that was. Um, I, I suspect that, uh, that this little kind of two parter does have. It has a bit of influence and echoes down the line. Mm. I think. So that brings yeah, us to our right. final story. Yeah, which doesn't really have a name. <laughs> <laughs> So it's split into four chapters, each supposedly from the focus of, um, of a different character. So you have Kane's story, Abel's story, the warrior's story, and Frobisher's story. So this is a story where the Galactic Federation is, so we're, you know, post-Earth Empire in mm. the Federation span of things. And there are these creatures called the Skeletoids, which are humanoid cyborgs from the planet Vespin who have all but destroyed the Daleks and the Cybermen 
and are poised to in- next invade the Draconian Empire. Quite often, these skeletoids have kind of like they have like corpses inside of them. Mm. Uh, so uh, it reminds me very much of Devastation Arada. I was getting that, and also yeah. the most recent Capaldi season, uh, Oxygen, where you had the mm. corpses in the in the suits. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. The Doctor and Frobisher learn of this threat from uh, Kane, who is a homeless person they encounter, who uh, was formerly a college professor, um, who's been trying to develop his uh, own paranormal powers. And is kind of an interesting sequence where <laughs> the Doctor starts talking to him and uh, says, "You need a, you need a bath." <laughs> Come on, the TARDIS, and, and then and by the way, here's the shaving kit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's where he starts. He starts using his powers to kind of like to lift it, doesn't he? Or am I kind of getting confused? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the the Doctor also suddenly pops off to um, pick up Perry from New York. So where uh, sort of Perry's just kind of been living real life and is getting a bit sick of it. Again, slightly moffatty. Uh, and uh, Natalison sort of sets off to um, the planet Ankara uh, to uh, attend a conference on the Skeletoid Crisis. But mid flight, the TARDIS has been diverted to a totally different planet, a planet called Zaus. There, the travelers meet Kaon, the uh, same draconian warrior whom uh, the Doctor and Frobisher met earlier. Who died. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So earlier in his uh, his timeline, so this is mm. this explains why again very Moffaty with the whole timey wimey mm. uh, thing, where uh, explains why he knew of the Doctor, but the Doctor didn't know of him. And they also encounter Abel Gantz, who's a, an alchemist who's developed the ability to transform his flesh into any element and shape change. So not so much Frobisher, but more like I'd say if you're familiar with DC Comics, like Metamorpho. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah. But he has this ability due to a libra- uh, library accident, a laboratory accident <laughs> um, um, that was um, was apparently caused by the TARDIS's escape from the Funhouse. So more interconnectivity there with some of the previous stories. You can see why they organized this collection the way they did, mm. because it really does kind of continue on after Voyager, even though the the writers, you know, have switched. There's still a lot of callbacks to earlier stories. Yeah, yeah, there definitely are. So uh, Kaon um, believes that the six gathered there are the um, these prophecies chosen ones that will rid the galaxy of the Skeletoid menace. So they say that there's one of Gallifrey... Uh, one of Earth, and, um, and and we find out where Frobisher's home planet is, um, which I've forgotten. But uh, uh, but yeah, it's not it's not one that I think we ever visit again. I don't think it's ever mentioned again. Yeah. So uh, uh, Xenon, I think. Ah, uh, yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Yes. The Doctor uses the TARDIS to um, to kind of transport them all um, to Vespin, where they have a big old fight to kind of get into the Skeletoid control room because you know every alien race has just one control room. Um, this part felt very Guardians of the Galaxy to me, where you mm. have like a group or a team up. It also felt a little bit like Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, where you have the Doctor assembling a group of people from previous encounters that we may or may not have heard of before. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. those a little bit. So they have the the big fight, and then Abel, who's the one who um, is able to transform himself, uh, transforms himself into a giant bomb or essentially two different chemicals when combined, you know, explode, which destroys the Skeletoid's control room and these kind of giant mother brains which are operating it. The Doctor and his companions travel to Ankara once uh, the Skeletoids are destroyed back to the peace conference to say, mm. hey, the immediate threat has uh, been taken care of. Oh, one thing we did mention is that Davros gets mentioned in dispatches a few times. Because, like, I kept on expecting him to suddenly appear because like, they're... The um, the peace conference. So one thing kind of Davros to kind of rock up. I was like, yeah, you're not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he if he comes here offering peace, it's probably you know you might want to kind of not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, and there ends the Cain Abel warrior Frobisher story. <laughs> Perry and Frobisher travel both with the Doctor yeah. together, yeah. like in the next collection. Is that yeah. how it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah. Pretty much, and the occasional friend, which is all I'll say. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Which I think is it, nice. I think it's it, for me. It, it feels proper that Doctor Who magazine should have 
in it. So when the show's been televised, the current Doctor and the current companion. And mm. and it's fine if it has additional stuff like Frobisher. Uh, yes, definitely. But uh, but yeah, I, I I do think it is nice to to have the people that are on the show being represented. I'm of two minds of that. I I would agree with you for the most part. Although I I do like it when like you know when Sharon was with the Fourth Doctor, for example, mm. or you you know where you have different companions that aren't on TV. I mean, for the longest time you had you know just. Doctor Who magazine, right, in the comics. Mm. But now that you also have, you know, the ongoing comic series that IDW or Titan, it's, it's almost like um, there's enough room where I feel like as long as one of those two has the, the yeah. TV okay. team, then, yeah. then the other comic can maybe stray a little bit because i i feel like it's uh it's just nice to have that variety sometimes i think especially if you're not a if you're not a fan of the uh, yeah. whatever the current TARDIS <laughs> team is on tv yeah yeah that's true that's true i guess that's uh, yeah. so they're in voyager yeah yeah so what did you uh what did i make of it so um i mean, I, I, I still think that the astrolabus chapters are the strongest yeah it's brilliant explosion of imagination I mean, yeah, sure, there might not be a lot of kind of like... Well, I would say there's not a lot of big themes, but, I mean, there are, I mean, interesting, quite a few of the sadder moments of things that come from Frobisher. You know, Frobisher, bless him, does feel like not so much a tortured soul, but he's kind of, you know, he's been through the mill a bit, hasn't he? Uh, and he, he's, he's kind of enjoying, you know, he's enjoying his life. So he's mm. not this complete wacky character. Uh, there's a definite kind of you know there's there's a serious um, strand to it which i think probably kind of sums up you know, these stories quite nicely it's just great <laughs> <laughs> i enjoyed them as well i totally agree with you too it, it feels like from a it's it's this weird combination of absurdity but then there's this melancholy or sadness that's mm. tinged throughout it feels like even though on on its surface you know you're talking about Oh, here's the fairy tale story, or here's the you know really weird reality melting story. But despite those popping up kind of again and again, you do get these through threads of seriousness and kind of a I don't know if it's so much a take on life or an outlook on life. You know, it's mm -hmm. life is absurd, but you need to be able to pause and enjoy the humor of it. You know, and also reflect on some of the sadness of it. And I feel these collection of stories in particular really strike that balance of um of just being more intelligent than i think than you know a surface glance at what the subject matter is mm. might lend one to yeah. believe i think and the new adventures when they started the version of new adventures had a tagline being too broad and too deep for the small screen and i think that tagline lends itself very nicely to to this collection uh, so, because there's a lot more, there's a lot more nuance to this than uh, you know most of your six Doctor scripts on TV. Um, yeah. And John Ridgway's artwork throughout really ties it all together. And and even though you have two different authors for this collection, it's not that different though, because Alan McKenzie was he was acting as story editor, so he was the one that was kind of giving um, Steve Parkhouse the, uh, the various threads. Um, I think Steve Parkhouse was becoming very much a, a writer for hire, writing out Alan McKenzie's ideas, and that's the impression that I've got. Because um, it doesn't feel like a giant leap in style, certainly mm -hmm. not to me, between um, yeah, b between the, the Astrolabus and, and then the later parts. Yeah, and especially with the later parts calling back to some of those earlier plot elements too, it, yeah. do it doesn't feel like a clean break. It's it's it feels all kind of part of a whole. Yeah. Yeah. So, how would I score this? How are you right? Yeah. Um, I think this would be a 7 out of 10 for me, which is higher than what I've rated some of the short story and comic collections we've done in the past. Um, it's uh, it's it's almost an 8, but but not quite for me. It's um some of the uh I wouldn't call it sloppy, but some of the plot points, sometimes it's more of a visual thing where you 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 experience a story and you it, it, you end with more of a feeling mm. than you than you do with like oh well in this story I learned you know X about the Doctor Who universe etc. In, in that sense, it may have been a little bit too broad for me in scope, but really enjoyed the artwork. Uh, would recommend that people seek this out and experience it. It's it certainly it, it just adds a whole different dimension and texture to 
you know, the sixth doctor. Oh yeah. And it greatly kind of expands out his, his role and um, character arc too. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. So I'd say a seven for me. Uh, how about you? Yeah. Uh, nine. Okay. My, my hesitation there was whether or not I was going to go higher. Uh, I think, I think nine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think for 10, it has to be perfection. This is not perfection. For me, it's, 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 oh, it's, it's I mean, especially I mean, I think I think a large part of that nine is the Voyager Astrolabus stuff. Um, and I mean, but there, there, there's no there's no stinkers in this collection at all. I mean, I mm-hmm. think they're all they're all very good. And uh, yeah, and also you know, to kind of go back to what you said, Matt. Yeah, you know, if anyone's listened to this and they have never encountered the Sex Doctor and comics, go and get this. I mean, you can get this sort of easily enough. I mean, you don't seem to be able to get it in electronic format. Um, you can get this from sort of you know, most good online bookstores, uh, and uh, and and you can get sort of you know, moderately cheap secondhand copies, which is uh, you know unusual for Doctor Who books. It's 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 fabulous. It's a real visual feast, um, and quite a few of these things are kind of you know. I know what you're saying that some of these don't really necessarily add to to the Doctor Who kind of continuity, but things like I mean, Funhouse, I mean that's it's it's a mood piece, mm-hmm. um, as is the kind of like Kane through Frobisher stuff. And you see so many ideas being seeded that, as we are touching upon, feel like they've been run with uh, by uh, by later writers. The different bits of the show it feels so influential. But often, sometimes when you're reading something that's influential, it doesn't necessarily entertain because you just sort of say, "Oh, I see where it's gotten from there." But when I saw them somewhere else, it was better. And I don't necessarily kind of feel that vibe. Mm. So it's not got like this John Carter and Mars thing where it's all been ruined by the fact that sort of you know, others have kind of pilfered all the ideas here. That definitely doesn't feel. Yeah, you know, it has its own. It has its own unique flavors, but each mm. each story has its own little special brand. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Still, it, it manages to stay fresh. I think. Yes. Even though others may have come along and reiterated some of these themes or have done different riffs on them and have maybe developed them more fully but you can see where a lot of different stories could have you know we've we've listed a whole bunch of them you know from the doctor's wife to Silence in the library yeah yeah, some of the novels and and so you can see where this was a lot of people probably have read this and and were influenced either subconsciously or you know maybe overtly but visually it's it's gorgeous and I, i would love to see like an animated version of this yeah, uh, would would be really cool. And, and also, I mean, I read through the colorized version from the eighties as well as the, the black and white version, and the colorized version is pretty cool as well. But I think that that's that's pretty rare. If you find your if you if you find that sort of fairly cheap, then go ahead. And these are brilliant. Having read both, do you have a preference for the colorized versus not? Or yeah, I think maybe slightly more for the colorized one. But then, yeah, you know, if you go for the colorized one, you don't have Funhouse. You don't, you, know, you don't have kind of Kane story. Um, you don't have War Games. So, and you don't have the resolution of the Draconian. Yeah, well, you don't have any of the Draconian yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, none of the Draconian stuff. So, I feel like you've you felt similar about this one as to how I felt about Only Human last yeah, month. Yeah, yeah, it was so. close. I think, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pretty yeah. close. It's pretty close. Mm. Okay, marvelous. Well, that's well, Voyager in the bag. Yes, yes, that was a good, one. good. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Yes. Shall we move on to uh, listener feedback? Yes, let's. Let's start with Facebook. What mm. do we have? Uh... So on Facebook, uh, listener Jeff was uh, was was excited to hear what we made of Voyager. He very much enjoyed it, and also I I know of other people that were kind of like, "Oh, you're going to do Voyager? Great!" Uh, so <laughs> um, yeah, so so yeah, you should know by now that yeah, I think we enjoyed it. We had a kind of a, you know, a good array of likes and everything. But you know, do please feel free to kind of comment and stuff and and interact with us there or Twitter or send us emails. Speaking of emails, has anything arrived in our inbox? We have uh, one email this month from <laughs> a Madam Helen Smith, who Ooh, is okay. apparently a Canadian living in Africa who is diagnosed with terminal cancer, and she graciously wants to distribute her inheritance funds to us. Uh, totaling 6.5 million <laughs> but she doesn't specify the currency hopefully oh. not in uh canadian dollars so right. okay. that's our future trips to gallifrey one and chicago tartus sorted oh, that's my brexit strategy yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's unfortunately just the one um spam email this month but uh oh well when you started reading it, i was just thinking oh we're, co- we're coming dark here <laughs> 
It, uh, <laughs> it matches the uh, the tone of the comics, I think. Yes, yes, I think so. I think so. I think uh, so. Uh, on the Twitter side, though, we've been mm-hmm. having a, a pretty good month last month. We have a number of new followers, so thank you mm-hmm. to everyone who's discovered us there. A special thanks to Matt Holzman, who tweeted that he just found our podcast, and what a fantastic idea for a show it is. Uh, cheers. Um, we didn't come up with <laughs> the idea ourselves. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say we stole the idea. Uh, other people graciously let the idea go. We um, picked up the torch. Yes, we did. We did. Yeah. We did. And uh, apparently we're now in the Google Play Store for Android, which Yay! we hadn't been uh, unknowingly. <laughs> yeah, because neither is our Android users. <laughs> yeah. So we're now available there as well. So. Yeah. Uh, I think we're getting to the stage where, where you're going to tell the good folk at home and me um, <laughs> what we're going to be reading next month. And, uh, yes. And you've been keeping this one very close to your chest. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what this is going to be. Yes. Well, it's not a fifth Doctor story. So so no. um, for those keeping tab, it's it's something else. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking that, uh, you know, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time with the third Doctor. We did uh, The Face of the Enemy, but it wasn't a um, complete story, shall we say. So I was thinking, you know what, maybe uh, two Pertwee lights equal a Pertwee hole. Mm, okay. So I'm going to go with... Uh, Who Killed Kennedy? Ooh! Yes. Written by, uh, it says on the cover by James Stevens, but it's in fact written by David Bishop. Mm. And um, it's also available free online, so there's that. So if you've thought about reading along one of these months as a listener, the complete book is available... Legally. Legally (laughs) on uh, the New Zealand uh, Doctor Who fan club website, and we'll be tweeting out a link to that. Mm. Um, I'm not sure which version of the book I'm going to read, because the print version, you know, it's all there in one, but then the online version goes chapter by chapter and it has uh author commentary and continuity notes for each chapter too so there's like a an enhanced experience version <laughs> that you can uh yeah. follow along with and and read online yeah and i, I feel it, it kind of ties in too with um the recent novelization of rose i read where clive in the shed talking about how the doctor was present at the assassination of uh kennedy so <laughs> although i don't think it's a poorly photoshopped uh christopher eccleston <laughs> <laughs> but we shall see. Yes. I have read this book before, but it has been several. I mean, I read it 96 or 97, I would say. So yeah. um, it's been about 20 years. So I tried reading it, and the, um, the but I was reading the, the PDF chapter a bit, which I remember finding it was a bit difficult whilst kind of like on the move. Yeah, so so I, I did give up on it. So we, but that I don't think it was necessarily the quality of the book. I think it was just the difficulty of reading. So it'd be interesting to see how I, yeah. You can get it all in one big PDF. Yes, um, from the Kiwi site. It's got EPUB, Mobi, PDF, or you can have the individual. Yeah, they, they've improved it, which is good. So this is the as ah, the 20th anniversary edition that I'm looking at. Cool. Uh, ooh, which has a new ending after the original novel. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll read the paperback version I have, like the original, and then what I'll do is I'll go online and read the, yeah. the extra chapter or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. I'm looking forward to reading that. I'm too. I'm wondering too if we'll get more discussion too, if because so, it's free online. If um, other folks yeah. might chime in and send us their thoughts. Yeah, but I I, I am looking forward to it. I am I am looking forward to it. Yeah. No, it's good. It was one that I suggested to the original Doctor Who book club five years ago or so, mm. asking, hey, are you guys ever going to do this? I think the reply I got was that it didn't cleanly fall into uh, the four different ranges they were reading at the time. But they um, did scream the show cut. They did, yeah, although I think that was released <laughs> as a past Doctor adventure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Whereas Who Killed Kennedy was, I don't think it was ever really part of the Missing Adventure line. No, um, no, it, 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 it yeah, it it came out I think at roughly at the same time, but uh, but yeah, no, no it'd be, it'd be it'd be interesting. I thought that you were going to go for for the fiftieth anniversary short story collection, uh, ah. you know, the, the one including Neil Gaiman and others. And even when you were going to Doctor Light thing, I thought maybe you might go for maybe there were some other for Doctor short mm. stories that I wasn't aware of that were all going to be kind of thrown together. Because mm. I remember quite enjoying the fur Doctor short story from that one. Oh. Yeah, 50, I have the fiftieth collect the one you're talking about. Yeah. If we ever do that one, I, I might want to hold off. I guess in August or September they're going to be republishing it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. with the added thirteenth Doctor story. Oh. So. That'll cool. be um, yeah. No, I think that'll be good. Yeah, yeah. that'll be good to, to down do the that. line. Yeah, cool. All right. 
Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris Stefanda. Happy reading. Thank you for listening to the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Special thanks to George C. Music for use of their song, Doctor Who Theme, Swing Jazz Version. You can follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast and like us on Facebook. You can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. You can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to ANDWBC Podcast at gmail.com. And until next month, happy reading. I have done nothing except Doctor Who and Sherlock for around ten years, so I've got to be allowed to do something else. For instance, yeah. a novelisation of Doctor Who. That was a marvellous <laughs> piece of variety was there, it? wasn't it? That was it? a nice break. Yeah. yeah. I, I finished my book, and I, and I was really, really actually quite pleased with it. Then I read Russell's. I got immediately depressed. No. <laughs> it was much better. And vice versa. I read yours going, oh, I wish I'd done that. We're in trouble. The TARDIS is out of control. The TARDIS is always out of control. Is it worth interrupting my bath time? It's embarrassing. I'm all naked here. Frobisher, you're the shape of a penguin. You're always naked. Well, that's what you think. I usually morph myself a black and white pair of pants as well. Mm-hmm.